All right, everyone, let's get the show started. Welcome to our DevOps office hours. It's September 23rd. My name is Eric Osterman, and I will be leading the conversation. I'm the founder and CEO of Cloud Posse. We're a DevOps accelerator, and that means that we help companies own their infrastructure in record time by building it together with your team and then showing them the ropes. If that sounds interesting, head over to cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash quiz to get started. For those of you new to the call, the format is very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. So feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you want to jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, that's cloudposse.com slash office hours. We will automatically uh, post a video recording of this session to the Office Hours channel, as well as follow up with an email so you can share it with your team. So with that said, let's uh, kick it off. I don't have too many announcements today, uh, unless anybody else has uh, some to add to this. Uh, one of the things that uh, was announced was uh, GitHub is um, going to shut down API access uh, using just password authentication, which pretty much no one should be doing anyways. Um, and uh, using personal access tokens is still totally kosher, so don't uh, so it shouldn't affect pretty much anyone. But if you were hard coding like your GitHub bot users uh, password somewhere, that's going to stop working pretty shortly. I, they have a date here. I just struggling here in my thing to do it. So uh, the passwords are basic authentication. That, I thought it was basic authentication that they were giving out. Uh, so basic auth has already been deprecated, I believe. Um, like I, I was using basic auth in a bunch of places uh, with personal access tokens, and I think that stopped working. And this is yet a an additional deprecation, which is the use of the actual account level password. Um, as of November 13th, 2020, that's going away. All right, then the other, uh, any uh, questions related to that one on uh, API access and passwords for GitHub? All right, the other announcement is that uh, Amazon has uh, added an additional region for EKS, so it's now available in North California. Previously, it was only uh, Oregon on the West Coast here. So, okay then, uh, talking points. Man, we got a lot of questions uh, to get through today. Um, we'll also try and get to any that are posted in the Slack channel. Let me uh, queue up the Slack channel. If, uh, if you haven't yet joined our Slack team, you can head over to uh, slack.cloudposse.com Again, that's slack.cloudposse.com and you can participate in the conversation there. We have a office hours channel where uh, questions can be posted. All right, that's a good one. I'll pin that one from you, Brian. And we don't have to get through all these questions in order, but let's see how far we get. So, uh, one question that came up just relatively recently that I think is relevant to, um, to others doing some uh, continuous integration, especially like on Kubernetes, is what to do with your preview environments when your developers go home. Uh, should you be shutting them down or leave them online or are there other trade-offs that you can make? So, preview environments, also called review apps, uh, is a concept I believe originally kind of invented by Heroku which is this idea where when you open up a pull request, that can bring up a complete environment of your application with its backing services. And uh, you can use that to do some uh, acceptance testing on that pull request. Uh, if you ever run a very busy organization, that can get quite busy with lots of uh, preview environments. Easily I've seen over 50 to 100 of these uh, laying around and that might end up costing you some extra money. So 
there are two ways. Well, so the first question is, you know, is it worth to shut them down? I would say, you know, business wise, it's worth shutting them down, but it's not necessarily a cut and dry uh, solution because as your team grows, your team will be working at different hours throughout the day. Um, you might be a distributed team geographically. So what is the start of a day or the end of the day is not obvious. Um, other considerations are like, you know, some people putting in extra hours um, on, on nights and weekends and then if their environments are getting shut down randomly because of these automated processes, you aren't necessarily doing anyone any favors. So I think a, uh, a, a better approach to this would be one where it's based on activity of perhaps a pull request. So if the pull request uh, hasn't been synchronized for a number of days, then that environment might get automatically suspended or destroyed. Is any, anybody uh, uh, leveraging preview environments? And if you are, uh, how are you handling uh, the case uh, with um, just orphaned environments and the cruft that builds up? We piggyback on our QA cluster. Um, so we just deploy PR instances into, or PR, uh, deployments into a prefix namespace with just the PR as a prefix. Exactly, yeah. And so like our QA cluster is so heavily used that there's no reason to spin it down on the weekends, but we're not actually, we don't feel like we're paying extra for the, the PR um, deployments that we're doing because uh, the cluster is already pretty much a sunk cost. Yeah, yeah. So uh, let me, yeah, let, that's a good thing. That wasn't obvious by how I described this. So yeah, we assume that you leave the clusters online or whatnot. But if you have like the Kubernetes autoscaler deployed, as you're deploying more preview environments, you get more nodes that come online. And that means that that's a continuous uh, cost um, for operating those preview environments. Versus if uh, you were to destroy some of those, the size, the overall size and operating cost of your cluster would go down. Right. I've had issues with spinning down some environments where um, the limits on the number of SSL certificates from uh, that free thing that is automated uh, would yeah. would kick in and yeah. I would, would stop being able to uh, get new certificates after a while. Yeah. No, that's totally something. That's a separate topic in and of itself. Uh, I'll answer that one in a, in a second. Um, so, uh, so the, one of the things that we've done uh, for this same customer that we're talking about is we rolled out Spotinst Ocean. Uh, Ocean is a separate controller for Kubernetes that manages node pools for you. And that way you can at least use preemptible spot instances, uh, for your staging cluster and reduce your operating costs there with the trade-off of perhaps a little bit of instability, um, when pods get rescheduled. So. What Christian was just talking about uh, is totally a thing, especially when you're dealing with preview environments. So Let's Encrypt has a whole lot of different kinds of rate limits. Uh, and these apply to the number of certificates that were generated to, uh, per top level domain, uh, the number of certificates that were regenerated uh, per week. Uh, I think Jeremy, you probably remember what some of those other rate limits are, but there are quite a lot of them. And the problem with these rate the, limits, yeah, the, one, the one that you hit with preview environments is five reissues per week. Yeah. So you can only reissue. So if you're destroying that namespace, which would destroy the secret that contains the certificate, then it'll have to reissue that certificate. So uh, you don't want to delete those uh, if you want to avoid those rate limits. But there's another fix. I'll get to that in a second. Um, so, uh, let's see where I was at. So with, with these, uh, with these rate limits, uh, the problem is let's encrypt as a free service doesn't even give you an escape hatch of paying to increase your limits or like a support email where you can ask for, uh, those limits to be raised. So you are dead in the water if you exceed the rate limits for let's encrypt. And that's a, just something to be very aware of. So the way you mitigate the problem that you encountered there, Christian, is you use a wildcard certificate on the service load balancer for the ingress for that preview environments. So we deploy a secondary ingress 
for preview environments that have their own uh, TLS certificate um, with a wildcard. And that way we only generate one certificate pretty much ever, unless we destroy the ingress. Yeah, in my case, I was uh, deleting the whole cluster and ah. being the whole cluster, right? To save money. Okay, on... then you're just, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're, then you're just, yeah, ACM. <laughs> then you pretty much just have to use ACM certificates on your uh, load balance. Yeah. yeah. So, good point. Uh, Brian, uh, are you using Let's Encrypt It All on your uh, ephemeral or disposable clusters? We aren't just because of the rate limiting. Okay. Um, we have so many. So our demo cluster probably has like 200 different deployments. And um, it's just, yeah, we just don't want to run into the, the, the uh, rate limit problem. What is your strategy for managing ACM certificates that you use uh, with Kubernetes? Well, we only have, uh, so every, everything is subdomain. So like you can just imagine like blah.demo.whatever.com yeah. and then like blah2.demo.whatever.com. Yeah. So it's like, it, so we just use one single wildcard. So, pretty, so you're using wild a card. single zone with flat DNS. Yeah, so yeah. So wildcard certificate, yeah. Yeah, that makes it easy for us to do like things like the cluster, ephemeral clusters. So we, when we update the Route 53 record, it's actually, we don't even update the Route 53 record anymore because um, we use Global Accelerator. But when we did, it was wildcard wild card Route 53. So mm. we'd only update one record. Mm. That's cool. Uh, oh, that's cool. You're using the Global Accelerator. When did you guys roll that out? We rolled it out a couple months ago. It's been working pretty well. And it's quite cheap for what it provides. Um, and it's improved uh, uh, the usage of our app with our customers in the UK and China and um, other parts of you know, the world. Uh, and it was super easy to integrate. So gotcha. much easier to fix that than uh, some app, you know, micro performance issues within the application itself. Yeah, nice. Well, we should probably uh, we should probably have a, a session where we just go over uh, usage of Global Accelerator uh, at some point. That'd be cool. I, don't, I think this is the first time it's even been brought up in office hours. So we we use it too quite a lot actually. Oh, cool, Pepe. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, how are you using uh, the global uh, the AWS Global Accelerator? We we have customers uh, that require firewall whitelisting for IPs. Mm -hmm banks in different parts of the country. Australia, I think, is mandatory to do that somehow. I don't know. Okay. And so we, we are actually have to have a fixed IP endpoint instead of the cloud front endpoint. So we, we end up using Low Accelerator, which funny enough is faster. Like if, you, if you're inside of AWS and you hit the, an internal ALB and you measure that time, uh, the time that the connection took, and then you enable Global Accelerator with an external ALB, it's actually faster than hitting the internal ALB. Interesting. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And, and yeah. quite a lot faster, it's like 100 milliseconds faster, which is, which is like what? So I guess that they sell this super fast yeah. intranet where they have, where they connect um, Global Accelerator. So I don't know, it's interesting. That's cool. So uh, the next question that uh, I kind of picked up here just from um, our Slack community was, is there some way I can get Terraform to load a directory of uh, variable files, var files? And this, uh, you know, reinterpreting the question uh, as just basically, is there a way we can have a lot of configuration files? There's a pretty nice answer to this. So I thought, uh, since there's a lot of folks using Terraform um, to call out uh, this solution. So uh, there's, a, there's a number of, uh, you guys, am I sharing my screen here? You see this? Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, for some reason, I don't see the highlight that I'm used to seeing. Um, all right. So the, the one obvious way if you're using Terraform is that you could use the uh, .auto.tfvars extension. So you could have lots of uh, var files with .auto and then Terraform will automatically load those files uh, at runtime and pass those into your variables. 
But if you want to have more programmatic control over which configurations are loaded, you can't do that with var files. You'd have to do it another way. And with Terraform 0.12 uh, or HCL2, uh, some nice things became available. And that is that you can use the YAML decode function. So you can read a file in using read file and then parse that file as YAML and then use that file as a local uh, for that configuration. And then, you know, with uh, for loops and the rest, uh, there's a really nice way of uh, programmatically loading in configuration files with YAML. So this is, uh, this is near and dear to my heart because uh, more and more what we're doing at Cloud Posse is using YAML as our configuration format, using Terraform for the business logic, and then using maybe Terraform Cloud as the controller that executes everything and does the continuous delivery. So here's an example in our Terraform uh, Ops Genie Incident Management module. Uh, we have a, uh, a, an example of how to use a config file. And in this case, you have a directory with a bunch of YAML files and we load all of those. We merge all, all of those YAML files into uh, one local called Ops Genie Resources. And obviously this can be further parameterized as much as you need uh, to do within your application. Uh, the way we're using that in a nice way is more and more with, um, let's see, where I saved that, if I did here. I think I created it just recently. Yeah, so here's one way that we're using YAML configuration files uh, regularly. And in this case, we've defined uh, our own schema for YAML configuration file. Uh, top level is workflows where we define, uh, you know, how should a plan all work? Uh, well, we want to plan uh, on each one of these uh, projects. But going further on down here, we have uh, our YAML configuration for projects. So we have like uh, globals, we have uh, Terraform configuration settings. So Terraform, VPC, and all the variables that get passed there. We have EFS and all the variables for that, Transit Gateway, Postgres, EKS, uh, et cetera. So this is a nice way of consolidating all the configuration in a single config file rather than sprawling it across in 25 or 50 different var files, which has been the Terraform way of uh, doing a lot of things. All right, any uh, questions on um, how to load configurations programmatically? Um, one, one thing, um, <clears throat> can you guys hear me? Yep. Hey, Oliver. Um, I've started using that technique as well, and it, it works. It's really neat, uh, for sure. Uh, the one thing that um, I'm missing when I use it is the, you know, you don't get your editor helping you figure out what, what properties are in there <laughs> are in the, there's, there's no way to, to specify a schema for your YAML uh, right now in ways that I know of. Um, whereas with the, um, you know, with var files and so forth, you get a little bit of, you know, completion, auto completion, stuff like that. So. Yeah. yeah. I'll second that. I, I was doing, so this is Eric Berg. I was doing some work with the, uh, the, this ops genie module with the config module. And yeah, it's a little frustrating, you know. Um, it feels like it should be, you should be working in a templated environment once you're into the config, but you're not. So there's no completion, none of that stuff. Still very cool though. What are you willing to, com what are the things that you're wishing it would complete on in the configuration? Well, I remember, for instance, so, you know, you have a YAML structure and um, sometimes you're accessing a property that's two or three or four levels deep. Mm -hmm. And you remember the names vaguely and you can't do, you know, ABC dot DEF dot and it'll complete, you know, it'll, okay. it's not going to introspect your, your YAML okay. file to see if it's available. Kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I was looking at it the wrong way. You're saying actually in the Terraform code when you're referencing the locals. Exactly. And getting the completion versus... In the YAML configuration, you're not talking about complete yeah. the YAML yeah. configuration itself. I got you. Yeah, so there's- Actually, there's I found that in the YAML, um, there were a bunch of times where I needed to, and I, I don't have a good example for you right now, 
I can take a look at the config. But like, oh, for instance, like if you're referencing a team and you're creating, you know, a schedule, and you want to reference a team, you have to hard code that rife with possibilities of screwing that up. I would really love to be able to like, oh, let me just, you know, auto complete all of the teams that are, you know, that that would be the kind of thing that I, I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, I have an example of where we get around this. I'm just trying to see if I can share an example that is not sensitive, if you give me a second. So the interest, so one of the things that we do is that, so we, we run this in two ways. We run this uh, on the command line with a CLI, and we run this in Terraform Cloud, uh, where we uh, put these settings that were in the YAML into Terraform Cloud variables. And the interesting thing is then you do get validation at least. Um, and I, I, I haven't tried the completion thing if, if that would work, but I'll show you a quick example of what that looks like. Just give me a second here. So, hmm. nodes, oh, I'm looking in the wrong, hold on. Yeah, so if you take the variables and then you serialize them to a JSON file, the, 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 the stuff in the YAML, uh, which would be the way we do it when running on the command line, then you get something that uh, looks like this. So here we define a variable for node groups and uh, everything, uh, all the types uh, for each one of those, um, uh, those uh, properties of the node group. So I'm guessing when, you do, when we do it this way, and since we have a variable, then you're gonna get the completion that you're still looking for. Um, and this works because what we, we do is, so for Terraform Cloud, we can write that YAML configuration so EKS, um, this is a different config, uh, but like, so here, like this here, this is a map with a list. We can write that map with a list to a variable in Terraform Cloud, so that when Terraform Cloud calls our, our workspace, it, it passes it in as a Terraform bar. So even though we have YAML here, as the YAML is what we're interacting with, when we have when we uh, synchronize this YAML to Terraform Cloud, it gets synchronized as Terraform variables. Uh, we're going to have a working example of all of this in probably two or three weeks. We have the module already in progress, but it ha we haven't merged uh, our first release of it yet. So we'll do a separate talk on how to do this with Terraform Cloud. Um, on that, let's see. Any questions on that before I move on to the next uh, topic? Was there a big summary of like what the benefits of using Terraform Cloud were there versus some other solution? Oh, uh, very faint there. Someone was talking. Sorry, that was me. I'm not sure where my mic is. I was just asking if there was a, a clear difference on uh, what the benefit of using Terraform Cloud there was over some other solution. Okay, gotcha. So benefits of Terraform Cloud over, say, Atlantis or something, maybe. So one of the benefits with Terraform Cloud over Atlantis for this particular solution or scenario is that with Atlantis, there's no way to store the settings uh, for a workspace. So in Adla in uh, with Atlantis, it, it assumes kind of a, a, a uh, directory-based uh, file organization for everything. Um, so in Terraform Cloud, you create a workspace pointed to some VCS repository, and you can have as many workspaces pointed to that repository, you can create 10, and you can dif make each workspace differentiated by setting its variables as something different. 
So this is environment one, environment two, environment three, environment four, but they all point to the same exact repository. I think that Which helps. I forget Atlantis. <laughs> what was that, uh, Pepe? Which is why I fork Atlantis, and I added that option to define a YAML file per, in the same repo. Oh, okay. So, so you can have multiple environments, which is kind of like the same idea that Terraform. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's frustrating that, yeah, we, I mean, we, we wanted that in the very beginning when we started using Atlantis, and um, we, we patched it as well. We forked it and added that, but we've just stopped. Here, my, here's my kind of you know, professional observation is that there are a lot of great tools that have come up around Terraform, Terragrunt, you know, um, Spacelift, uh, Atlantis, but if but if they if it's not what HashiCorp is intending the direction to be, uh, you, you're you're taking a risk that it's it's going to continue to work for you as the product evolves and changes. So like uh, one interesting example of this is actually related to one of the questions here. Um, I'm on, let's, let me go to this slide here. Um, can anyone uh, chime in on the pros and cons of using Terraform workspaces? And uh, this is a good question. One that we've done a mea culpa on or an about face on at Cloud Posse. I use workspaces. Um, uh, was that a question? I didn't hear the first part of it. No, I was just saying that I, I've, I've been using workspaces okay, cool. probably for like the last three or ish, four -ish years now. Um, and the reason why we used it was because of uh, the ability to kind of do uh, less or more dry Terraform code. Um, I think in hindsight, I if I were to start fresh now, I probably wouldn't use it. We kind of do a whole like um, saying the variables as like maps to strings and then using the workspace to kind of, uh, or interpolate the workspace and like use that to, um, to def uh, decide which variables to use, um, which, at this point, when you have a bunch of variables, they're all like map string types. It's just not, I don't think it's as clean anymore uh, as opposed to like the way you guys are doing it now versus like just like a file per environment instead. Our YAML file per environment. We, so we, we Cloud Posse has this, we've, we've done a total about face uh, this year, uh, starting in January. Um, man, I, I'm still in like February. To me, this year has just started, even though this year is almost over. I don't know about anybody else, but COVID has totally, messed with that with me so for all year we've moved over to using workspaces open source terraform workspaces is what i'm talking about right here um, and the benefit with that uh, i agree is that in some ways it makes it a lot more dry i i think that there's a lot of folks in the community using terragrunt and they would probably uh differ with that opinion and they're just two ways of doing it we so my opinion on this has been that Look, Terraform used to never recommend using workspaces for different like stages, like production and dev and testing. They said that was not a recommended way of doing it. But that language has now been removed from the Terraform documentation, and now they promote using workspaces, although the, the technic, technically the way workspaces work in Terraform Cloud, and this is more confusing, is a little bit different than the way workspaces work in Terraform open source. Uh, but conceptually, they're still the same thing where you operate on the same code, but in a different state. And There's also the caveat that the Terraform workspace in the cloud actually doesn't integrate with the Terraform workspace CLI. Uh, or open source Terraform. Yeah, yeah, they're um, different. In Terraform Cloud, they're different. So like you can't even, you can't even use your workspace in your remote execution because everything in the, in Terraform Cloud is actually the default open source workspace. And so like 
if you're using the works the Terraform Cloud workspace to make decisions, like I we use ours to uh, our our workspace names are always like environment underscore uh, the region that it's deployed in, and so we use that information to make decisions within Terraform, and so we had we had to actually use a use um a little workaround where you actually add the workspace variable in the Terraform cloud workspace mm. and then reference that. Um, I can yeah. paste kind of how we do that. It's, it's, uh, we didn't, we didn't make this up ourselves. We, there's a, there's a, there's a Terraform issue open that people com complain about this, uh, about, and that it's kind of the workaround everybody's been using. All right, let me uh, pull it up here. Or did hey, Brian, to your point about, you know, having the pain of having, it sounds like you do one var file that then you use all of your vars are as part of like one single map that you then, you yeah. know, depending on the workspace. Yeah. Did you, I mean, is it not that you had the ability when you set that up, it sounds like you set it up a number of years ago, but is it not that you had the ability to separate that out into different var files and then just use the var file that corresponds to the workspace name? You can't do that with the uh, Terraform cloud. Yeah. So, yeah, and I thought you were talking about open source, Brian. I, yeah, I'd be, but we use both Terraform cloud and the CLI. But to your point, we actually, um, we actually use like the map to make, or we, we pass in the Terraform workspace uh, into like certain variables as a map. So like say like region, for example, it'd be like region and then like uh, we pass in the Terraform workspace to the region variable. And then that would, you know, make decisions based off of that. Um, I don't know if there's a good way to do that type of logic with separate, like uh, separate variable files. I think you do need that like map to string. Um, Maybe it's a Terraform Cloud thing that I that I don't understand. Um, yeah, I have to, example, I've right. used Terraform Cloud before, but I, only I can lightly. probably show like an example. Um, yeah. Let's see. If if you want, um, I can share my screen real quick, uh, Eric. Yeah, go ahead. Try to find a good example, sorry. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Something like this, like, um, well, like we, we use the map to like pass in the, you can imagine like the workspace uh, instead of local environment, but then like we have variable files um, that are just like for each, like this is the workspace that gets passed in or something. Um, I don't know if you can do that with, um, sorry, this isn't the best example. This one's probably better. Hmm. But basically, um, yeah, we basically use these like map, uh, these like maps, yeah. and then we pass in. Imagine this is like Terraform dot workspace. We don't actually have to change this up because um, of Terraform Cloud, but it used to be something like this, and then. We just have the workspace here, um, and then the different ma maps to like different. You can imagine like US East two. That's pretty um, clean. I like the yeah. like the way you did that. Um, I just like the the way like we've been moving in the direction of using like I don't, I don't know M bars and like YAML files to like configure specific like environments. Um, I don't know, maybe the grass is green on the other side. This has worked well for us. Um, it's, it's kind of just this, like, 
I think I, the, the type map string thing is kind of um, something that I feel like is a little bit of an anti-pattern, but I don't know if that's just self-conscious. I don't know. Yeah. Cool. I, and where I see this pattern working well, uh, if one wants to adopt it as an alternative, especially is in root modules, which are the, you know, the most opinionated level, which is for your organization and your business logic. Cool. Thanks, Brian, for sharing that. That was cool. And let's see here. I'm going to share. I think uh, one good thing about having it as the, the everything in one variables file is um, it makes it easier to like kind of see all the different environment differences all in one file versus like having it in like imagine you had for us we all like a lot of our terraform is uh is only for like three different environments um so it's not terrible if you had it in like a dev file and a qa file and a quad file but um if you had more than that it might become unbearable mm -hmm. cool so that's uh, so yeah let's uh let's cover let's cover uh you know another question that was asked in the community this week um which was uh you know what are some of the advantages maybe of uh using uh the cloud posse uh terraform eks modules or just in general cloud posse modules over some of the ones that are in the community. And obviously, as CEO and founder of Cloud Posse, I'm going to be pretty opinionated. Oops, I clicked on the wrong Oh, boy, do I have opinions about this. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Here it comes. <laughs> Self-promotion. Uh, OK. So uh, wow, this was also a hot button topic of 51 replies. I didn't realize there was quite that many replies on uh, on this one, but what, one of the big differences between the Cloud Posse uh, modules and some of the ones you're going to find in the um, community ecosystem, we're talking Terraform AWS modules as well as just general ones around the web, is that uh, our modules were all built to be internally consistent. So the way we pass variables between our modules is almost always the same. So we always support namespace, we always support name, label, a label order, these things that are available, if you look at the Terraform, uh, Terraform null label module, this is central to all of our modules. And this is what makes sure that this is what we do to ensure that all of our modules work with all of our other modules. As you work with a lot of Terraform modules, you realize that isn't always the case. Not all modules are designed to be uh, uh, instantiated any number of times just by changing some variables. Uh, they have a lot of hard-coded resource names that might create conflicts if you try and deploy that uh, module a couple times. So uh, that's one of the big reasons why you'd want to consider using Cloud Posse modules. But the other really important one is that we have integration tests for every single module that is HCL2. We have integration tests. In fact, that was a requirement for us to adopt HCL2. So if you go into any one of our modules, you'll see that is HCL2. You'll see a test folder with a, a source subdirectory with our Go Terra tests. Um, these are, you know, not expand, not like uh, totally comprehensive, like the test coverage doesn't cover every variable on or off and doesn't do a full matrix, but it does cover the you know the eighty percent of cases that cause most modules to fail, which is do they plan, do they apply, do they destroy cleanly, and that's one thing that we assure with all of our modules that they do, and that's what allows us to accept pull requests uh, more quickly than uh, some other projects. Even that though has struggled because uh, we get a lot of pull requests. Um, all right, so that's me saying my two cents. Anybody have any uh, pros or uh, dissensions to that? So the question was specifically about the EKS module. So I, I want to talk about that one. Yeah. Um, but, it, you know, in, I, so I have personal experience with that module, the one that the one that the guy was talking about. It's it's um, no, not that one. The uh, not the cloud posse one, the uh, the Terraform AWS modules one. Yeah, yeah. And uh, 
I used it in production for like a year and it was terrible. Oh my God. It was awful. But, um, the reason was like, it's, it was one guy, you know, maintaining it in his free time and they were constantly, you know, accepting pull requests with breaking changes and stuff. And, um, you know, after finding cloud posse, and switching things over, it's just been so much more stable all over, all together. Um, so that, that's, that's my two cents. I think conceptually, this is also an important thing to realize about our modules and how we architect them is that our modules are designed to do one thing, one thing really well. And we try to, while modules should be opinionated about something, they shouldn't be so opinionated uh, that uh, you, your, your business logic becomes unmanageable. So one of the big differentiators between this EKS module and Cloud Posse is that what we did is we decomposed it from day one into lots of different modules so that the business logic and the versioning is uh, disconnected. So we have uh, you know, one module just for the EKS cluster resource itself, one module for the EKS workers using an auto scale group, one using the EKS managed node group, one using the Fargate profile, and we're probably going to be releasing a node pool flavor for spotins.io uh, soon, but we haven't yet uh, worked out the uh, details for that. But it's nice because uh, we, we were able to move faster without having to worry about testing every scenario uh, that we keep it and maintain its uh, backwards compatibility. I've used the uh, AWS module, ZKS module, and yeah, they, they had some breaking changes, but those were because there were new features either in Terraform or in EKS. And I was fine with that. Yeah, they... I, 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 I see the Cloud Posse modules being significantly more opinionated. As you've said, you use the same tags for absolutely all your modules and all your resources. I think those are way too many tags that may not be needed, or maybe I don't like the name of them. There are also um, the Terraform AWS modules and the maintainers are also looking into splitting this module up into a bunch of smaller modules because now that EKS has evolved so much with uh, from just having EC2 to manage node groups to Fargate to all that jazz and it's becoming a bit unmaintainable. But I've used it in production and yeah, there have been breaking changes, but I wouldn't fold them for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think the issue here is um, I, I've commented even on this one. Um, I forget what it's, I forget what unmanageable or something. I, don't, I forget what the issue is. The one in the middle. Oh, it's complexity. It's search for complexity. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, one. This, yeah, so this is the this is the big one and this was kind of a reflection on like uh exactly what you you guys are talking about and did the module get uh too much? Um look at this, Mr. Andrew himself, first comment. Andrew, that loser. Hashtag first. <laughs> yeah, uh posted some things. Uh, I gave my two cents, uh which is a little different. Like I mean I one of the things I thought was uh, compelling about the uh, community module was that you know it, it was a very easy starting point for anybody wanting to get started with uh, EKS. But the fact that every node group flavor and the node group architecture and node groups are like integral to how you architect Kubernetes, and the fact that that is baked into one module, that to me, yeah, we're we're arguing like tip for that. Uh, no, this is more opinionated. That's more opinionated. To me, that's more opinionated on the architecture side. Whether or not we have a consistent con convention on naming, yeah, we're opinionated on that. I I, I take that one on the chin um, for uh, our naming convention. One thing though to note on the null label uh, stuff that we've uh, we've done some amazing things lately to support the full. So, so null label is opinionated, but it is also incredibly flexible in terms of uh, the number of parameters that it supports and the escape hatch with attributes and the ordering of it with label order. The problem was we didn't support label order everywhere. 
So people who wanted to have their, their resources named differently couldn't do that because we didn't support it. Now we're uh, probably at least halfway through, if not more, updating all of our modules to support a pattern that we call context.tf. And that's if you look in the exports folder of no label, that's this context file. We drop this context file into every one of our modules now, and we ensure interoperability and maintainability um, as, as we introduce new modules and uh, update them. I just did the upgrade uh, for a couple of my root modules um, for my current project to using context.tf, and I would say big thumbs up in this regard. I think it really kind of slims things down and makes it kind of nice that you just pass around this single, this single module that really kind of provides all the tags across all resources. And when you're in a you know multi-account um, organization, uh, you know having those tags for billing purposes is really critical. And that's like I basically look away from the Terraform AWS modules and look towards Cloud Posse just because if I can stay consistent in terms of tags and naming, then I know that hey I'll be able to find this. My team members will be able to find this and the people that are in charge of billing for this organization are gonna be able to find, you know, split it up to X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that vote of confidence, Matt. I'll, I'll second that, no label is amazing. And having consistency in labels for everything without having to stress about doing it yourself is just life-saving. I've been using no label in my own modules even, because it makes, a ton of sense to have that standardized naming format for you know it makes it's a lot easier on the user of my modules to be asked okay what's the namespace what's the stage and what's the name yeah you know they understand that they get that you know versus just kind of willy-nilly naming whatever they want yeah come up with a a name come up ask the user to come up with a good name man that's one of the hardest things ever uh we struggle with so, uh, also what's cool about this is that now if you're using this, if you set the tags, you know, at the root level, uh, those will be propagated to every other module all, all the way down. So your tagging uh, for billing purposes uh, should, should persist. Also, it was Jeremy on the call, actually. This was uh, one of his big uh, pet peeves that he helped, uh, helped us get this implemented. Yeah, well, um, Eric and I put our heads together to come up with the, this context TF. I was, I hate the fact that we used to have to copy and paste all of these attributes all over the place. And then when we added an attribute to null label, we had to copy and paste everywhere, all, all over the code. It was just, uh, it was just very unpleasant. And uh, I, I wanted this. I wanted this context TF file. I wanted to say let, let's just have a file that we dump into every project, and it takes care of it. And um, uh, I think that was Eric's idea when he got started, but he didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Terraform was well, then at version eleven and didn't really have the support that we needed. But uh, now that we were moving to Terraform thirteen and I had a better handle on, on what we could do. Um, we we came up with a system where the uh, the null label still has all of the um, all of the logic, uh, but by simply updating this one file, we bring any uh, once the, once we've converted over to this format. As no label evolves, I mean, we just recently added this um, length limit uh, on IDs. Um, you know, nothing had supported that before because that was new. If we add a new feature like that to no label, all we need to do to roll it out to all of our um, modules once we're done with this conversion is update that context TF file in all of the repos. Only 150 pull requests, but it's a whole lot better than what it was before. Does this does this length limit um, uh, truncate or fail if the length is too long? 
Uh, it's truncate with a hash to try and keep it um, unique. Got it. Okay. That's what I, I was. I was struggling trying to figure out a way to. Um, I have a a resource that cannot be longer than sixty three characters, but it's way down in my you know Helm file versus bubbling up all the way to the top of the Terraform. And I was wondering if there's a, a decent way to make Terraform fail if a variable is longer than a certain number of characters. In 0 0.13, I think that's possible, right, with uh, validation? Yeah. yeah, there's variable val validation in Terraform 13. You can oh, write a, awesome. an, an arbitrary validation rule for variables. I'm going to have to look into that. But overstating it, but a pretty flexible one. Yeah, are, are we doing that in the EKS module? I forget. Oh, somewhere we're doing it. Um, we're doing it in null label, I think. Um, but let's go just look for validate. Where you, oh, where fantastic. You I found it. It's right here. I'll post it in Office hey, Hours. This was an option also to use in Terraform 12, but you had to. Was, was validation an it. option in Terraform 0 12? It was an yeah. experimental option that you could enable uh, with the feature flag towards, okay. the, towards the end of Terraform 12. Hey, Martin, good to see you around, man. Long time. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, it's going well. <laughs> it's going well. All right, so let's see what else. We, we only got a few more minutes left. Um, let's see what uh, a one of the most press, let's see in the Office Hours channel what the uh, what any other questions are. Brian, I think you had a question earlier. I did, but uh, I thought you had a few other pins that you can go over yet. I just sent mine today. Yeah, it was just that day. Well, I like to, you know, you're a regular. I'd like to see if I can uh, help answer you quickly here. If there's a good way. So Grafana users, have you found any useful community dashboards that you would recommend? And what's the general opinion about community dashboards? Alternatively, how do you manage your Grafana dashboards? And should it be uh, codified read-only in the UI? Great question. Also good because we got Jeremy on the line who's done, spent way too much time working on Grafana dashboards from an automation perspective, infrastructure as code perspective. And uh, we've also worked with a bunch of the community dashboards as well. So uh, we, we have identified a list of the standard Grafana dashboards that we use. Um, the biggest downside with like the community dashboards, I would say is that none of them really have support for multiple clusters. So if you wanna have an aggregated Prometheus and Grafana cluster, and you wanna be able to visualize the metrics per cluster instead, that isn't by default a, uh, like a, a parameter in those dashboards. So not a big deal, you can fork it, you can add it, but now, you're in, now, you, add, now you just added that much tech debt that you gotta maintain. So, the other issue with Grafana dashboards is a standard one with just infrastructure as code. Um, that is like, let's, let's face it, the easiest way to manage dashboards is click ops, you know, get, get it to look the right way in the UI. Uh, designing a dashboard in YAML, not exactly that easy or in JSON. So what the workflow ends up becoming is design it in Grafana, export it, put it back into source control, redeploy it with source control to the environments that you need it in. That, that's exactly what I'm doing right now is, yeah, is that's, creating the dashboard in Grafana and then copying the JSON. Yeah. So, so then the other problem is there's like three or four or five, I don't know how many different ways of uh, installing dashboards uh, in Grafana, especially if you're on Kubernetes. Under Cloud Posse in Geodesic, we have a script. Uh, Jeremy, is your script in uh, Geodesic? I forget. I don't think it's in Geodesic. You guys, don't you just use the Helm file? Uh, no. So here's the thing that are we. Tr I was all excited about um, the Prometheus operator and in Grafana. So there it is, Grafana DB. Um, um, I was excited about having. Um, uh, dashboards as uh, Kubernetes resources, um, which you can do with Prometheus operator. The problem was that 
those are what any of those things that get configured those are read only and um, under Grafana that we were using at the time I think it was Grafana 5 um, if you wanted to make a change to anything um, it would you couldn't do it um, in order to make a change to the dashboard um, you had to um, export it and re-import it as a separate dashboard uh, because the configuration was read-only. Um, so this gave you then a duplicate alternative dashboard. Um, and if you weren't using um, SQL, uh, some, or, you know, some sort of persistence for configuration storage, other than the, the um, Kubernetes resource, then all of your changes disappeared when Grafana went away. Um, so um, that's kind of my worry. Yeah. So what we came, what we ended up doing is saying that you have to use um, a database backend for Grafana that ha that's persistent, um, and we load the dashboards uh, using the Grafana API. Uh, we upload the dashboards through the API so that they are part of the dynamic configuration and anybody with edit privileges can edit them. And those edits then persist um, uh, across everything as long as the, the uh, SQL database persists. And this tool is um, that Eric's showing is uh, in GDSIC is a helper that um, manages that. You give it the um, Grafana API user, API key, uh, and a, a root URL um, so that it can get to the Grafana API. And then you can give it um, a variety of, of uh, pointers to community dashboards and it will adapt the public dashboard to the and do some some um, normalization and uh, get it so that you can update it and um, uh, I mean upload it and install it. Was it that product. the community dashboards were missing this uh, header? No, this is a whole other problem is that the, the Grafana um, and they made progress in it in the current version of Grafana. I haven't had time to investigate it. Um, it works better now, but at the time, the export format um, was not the same format as the um, upload format <laughs> uh, because the export format was a template um, specifically around things like getting the data source connected so that what you exported was a template that you were meant to install via ClickOps uh, that would allow you, when you installed it, to connect um, you know, parameters in the dashboard to your particular setup. Um, so you would, uh, connect, if, the, if the dashboard expected a Prometheus data source, you know, there would be this template of Prometheus data source, but you had to convert it to connect to your Prometheus data source. So this script uses some uh, conventions. It basically took the conventions from the template that everybody was using, and we adapted our installation to use the same kind of conventions and the script to make the modifications. And um, it's worked quite well for us. We're in a very you know, we have a lot of control over this situation uh, in that we're installing Grafana uh, uh, so we can set it up the way we want. Um, but uh, prior to Grafana 7, this was definitely my preferred way to handle the situation. I think Grafana 7 gave us some new options worth investigating, but I haven't, as I said, I haven't had a time to really look into it. So if when you're provisioning Grafana for the first time with like Prometheus operator, maybe on like a new cluster. Does, so you guys don't do any like um, any actual deployments of Grafana dashboards via the 
Prometheus operator? Correct. We've disabled all um, of the uh, installation of the dashboards um, everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And because any dashboard that gets provisioned at the Prometheus operator level, is, as I've said, is read only. Yeah. Um, and it just causes pain for anybody who wants to use it to do anything. And then you guys have in your automation um, something that pre populates the database with that, like. So we have, a, we have a script that has a list of dashboards that calls Grafana DB once per dashboard. Yeah. You can see here this example. So what's nice about this is also you can specify uh, community dashboards. Mm -hmm. You can specify any GitHub URL. So it's pretty dry in that sense. Or you can specify a local file. And that file can be in JSON format or YAML format because like when you when, when you when you want to reuse or just borrow as many of these dashboards as possible, supporting all the different formats just became more yeah. practical. And when your say your Grafana pod goes down, you guys don't actually rerun this Grafana DB. This is only run the very first time, right? Right, because we're because we have Grafana backed up by uh, by RDS a remote uh, database. Yeah, yeah, okay. uh, that makes sense. SQL or Postgres yeah. database. So. Like, yeah. I'm just using a default SQLite, so um, mm. I should probably use a remote database. You could use SQLite on an EBS volume if you want. That would probably also work fine. Yeah, our EBS volumes are ephemeral because um, our clusters are ephemeral. Um, yeah, so you don't actually want to use the RDS instance. You can just do a very small RDS instance. Uh, you could also use EFS. We're, we're kind of. Um, yeah. We're going through a phase of love-hate relationship with EFS, but um, uh, you could use if you if your cluster doesn't dis if your whole cluster is not. I you could use I ran into an issue with EFS with Prometheus just because we run two different. Um, we could we have a possibility of running two different Prometheus pods pointing at the EFS um, at EFS when we provision a second cluster to do like a blue green. Um, I feel like that might cause an issue with Grafana as well. If if like someone's trying to yeah to make an update to a dashboard while another Grafana is um, another Grafana pod is 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 um, is being spun up and I don't know doing other changes. So I think RDS yeah. is probably my best bet. Um, but cool. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we did not get through all the questions today uh, for office hours. Uh, we will just continue on those next week uh, and pick up from where we uh, left off and as well as answer any new questions that come up. So with that said, I'd like to uh, just you know remind everyone that you know if you haven't already signed up for uh, or registered for office hours, you can do that by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours and uh, you know, submit your email, you'll get an invitation there. The other thing is uh, if you want to uh, sign up for our newsletter, you can head over to newsletter.cloudposse.com. Um, it's been pretty infrequent so far, but we are, uh, we have not forgotten all of you out there subscribe to our newsletter and we will be sending, uh, getting back to sending those out, I hope pretty soon. So a uh, recording of this will be shared to the Office Hours channel, as well as uh, syndicated to our podcast at podcast.cloudposse.com, as well as to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash cloudposse. Well, see you guys uh, all uh, same time, same place. Uh, look forward to next time. Take care.